Um, we just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us in our second um, webinar. Um, today we have Scott Metzger, um, CEO of uh, Metzger McGuire Products. Um, Bosco and I will be here as the, uh, as the panelists. So if you guys have any questions, we're going to start a, a, a side chat bar so that you guys can feed ongoing questions throughout the presentation. Um, and Scott will have his uh, PowerPoint presentation up and going through it. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session to go through all of those questions um, and any other ones you guys might have uh, at the end. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to go through Scott's bio so everybody can have a little background history. Uh, Scott's the president of Metzger McGuire, a New Hampshire-based manufacturer of concrete floor joint fillers and repair products. Scott is a member of the ASCC CPC Board of Directors and participates in many trainings and seminars across the country related to polished concrete. Mr. Metzger is an active voting member in other concrete industry associations, including the American Concrete Institute's Technical Committees, 302, 360, and 310, and is the secretary of the ACI 310OJ specification for polished concrete. Scott is involved in the development and monitoring of numerous corporate retail surface repair and enhancement programs and has published a number of technical articles relating to industrial floors and floor joint, joint treatment and protection. So thank you, Scott, for being with us today thank you. Um, and, uh, and giving us this presentation. So the floor is yours. I should also mention that I'm a Sagittarius and I, uh, I like dog racing. It's one of my favorite hobbies. So <laughs> just so you can get to know each other a little bit. So. <laughs> All right, we'll start in with the uh, with filling joints and stain and polished concrete floors. And for, for those of you out there, I know that this was advertised a little bit as like joint repair, which we had a little bit different understanding of which direction to go. But um, we're going to talk mostly about joint filling and just some of the pitfalls and things to watch out for to make sure that you don't end up hurting yourself on a job or, you know, losing money. Um, and uh, we certainly can talk about repair things if we need to during the, during the course of the conversation. Um, if any of you have questions or anything else, feel free to jump in on the, uh, on the chat thing or what have you. I think Bosco and Kristen are going to be doing that mainly. But, um, yep. and, uh, and other than that, i will see if we can go through here. And uh, hopefully, since you guys are all homebound anyway, you won't have to operate heavy machinery after I get done. Because I recommend you just take a little breather afterwards. <laughs> Maybe rest for like 10, 15 minutes before you do anything dangerous. Don't work with any power tools or anything. So um, just a real, real brief introduction to our company. You know, uh, Kristen kind of introduced me a little bit. Um, we were founded in 1967 um, by my father, Steve Metzger. He was a, uh, a major caulking contractor in the, uh, in the greater Chicagoland area and was called out oftentimes to, uh, to you know, fill joints with urethane uh, in warehouse buildings and, and was starting to see a lot of deterioration and joint erosion from, from the, those materials not being suitable. Structural materials were too rigid for those kinds of applications. So after a number of callbacks and failures, he came up with this concept in his mind that what we needed was something that was both hard and soft, something that was rigid enough to protect the edges but also had a little bit of give and wouldn't weld panels together. So he worked with a, a chemist to formulate, you know, started with a structural epoxy and, and started softening, softening, softening until he got to what he called a semi-rigid material. Um, we introduced the first semi-rigid joint filler into the marketplace, MM80, which many of you are probably still familiar with, uh, in about 1973. And at that time, primarily was being used by his company and he was selling some to in-house folks to, to do repairs and things. And then it really just kind of started taking off in the industry as people recognized it had some real potential. And so he started selling it to other contractors and ultimately got out of the uh, contracting business altogether in about the mid to late 1970s and went full time into, uh, into the material side. Um, all the American Concrete Institute and Portland Cement Association guidelines for semi-rigid fillers are based on the MM80. That's why they all call for a sure A hardness of 80. Um, and I think I listed on that slide as well, just because everyone asks what MM80 means. It's pretty straightforward. MM equals Metz McGuire and the 80 was the, just happened to be the sure hardness of the material. So, uh, so we spent a lot of time in the late 1970s in the ACI committees and Portland Cement Association getting these standards in place. Many of these same standards remain the same today. There has been some discussion about moving the shore A hardness up to 85 just because wheels have gotten smaller and harder. 
Pyrac picker stackers, the whole thing. But by and large, a lot of these standards have not changed since we introduced these products in the 1970s. And in fact, the MM80 is still by far the most widely used uh, joint filler in industrial type buildings, warehouse distribution center, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, as Kristen mentioned, we, we remain very involved in, in those industry organizations. I've always been a strong believer that if you're in this industry, you should be in this industry, be an active participant, always be working to improve it and make it better. And a, a really a key aspect of that, I think, is education, which we're, we're so heavily involved in and so heavily endorsing. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're, we're doing this seminar today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about joint filling. And, and this slide uh, deck is primarily related to stain polished concrete, as I know that's, you know, we certainly have folks doing both. The principles are very similar, but there's some things that are a little bit more unique to the stain polish aspect. And I know that a lot of you, um, you know, are, are purchasing those kinds of materials from, uh, from Runyon. So in a short period of time, you know, concrete's evolved from a work surface to a showroom surface, right? Like 20, 20 years ago, didn't have a lot of demand for colored materials. Didn't, people didn't care so much what the finished product looked like. Um, that all is completely changed. Even if, if we're talking about industrial facilities now, it's just a whole different world. The expectations aesthetically are so much higher. Um, you know, again, this is a kind of crack repair that you probably could have gotten away with 10 or 15 years ago. Warehouse owner would have been fine, whatever it works, it's protecting the cracks, but I wouldn't be real proud of doing this kind of work today because um, it just, it's not going to meet the client's needs or expectations. So what we have today now is a situation where our repair materials and our joint fillers have to meet both performance criteria and an aesthetics criteria, which means we're gonna to have to look at colored materials. We're gonna to have to look at, do these products have color stability long-term? Uh, the flushness of the, of the appearance of the material in the end? Um, lots of different aspects like that. Um, so let's talk specific to, to joint filling, because obviously this is the key aspect of all stain polished concrete floors that really needs to be done. I know there's certainly floors out there where the owner says, I don't care about the joints being filled. I just want the floor to be shiny. But then we find about 50 or 60% of the time after you get done with that whole polishing process, they come back and say, oh, I don't like the joints. Can you fill them now? So we'll talk about that a little bit too and, and what specific measures you might have to take differently if you're doing it at the end. Um, when it comes to semi-rigid poly, uh, joint fillers, again, there's really two main types and only two types, epoxy joint fillers and polyurea joint fillers. And polyurea is, is certainly the, the trendy product, if you will. It's only been on the market for about 20 years. When it first came out, it was, it was being sold as kind of a miracle product that will move with the joints, it's color stable, it cures fast, you can do everything on it. But really, in a, from a cured property standpoint, both fillers are almost identical as long as you're using products with similar shore hardnesses. And really the key difference in which one is, you know, what the difference is between the two is going to be your cure time, essentially. Um, having said that, we tend to use polyurea joint fillers in polishing far more frequently than we do epoxy joint fillers. And there's a couple of key reasons for that. Obviously, one, we got faster cure time, which everybody's job now is fast, fast, fast track. If you're doing retail work, if you're doing any kind of fast track construction, you know, being able to get on that floor in an hour versus six or eight or 12 hours that an epoxy requires is very desirable. Uh, polyureas are far more color stable. Epoxies tend to yellow a little bit over time. Um, epoxies tend to stain the surface because they dwell so long and, and stay uncured. They tend to leach into the concrete surface. So they'll leave like an oily residue looking stain, which is virtually impossible to remove unless you're doing a real heavy grind. Um, there's no heat required to shave them like we do with the epoxy joint fillers. They build up their curing properties quite different. So with the epoxy, you're really not going to shave until it's reached you know, a substantial amount of its hardness. That requires heat to soften it up a little bit to get a really good smooth profile. And then lastly, the, uh, the polyureas tend to take a little bit better uh, gloss, a little bit higher polish level than an epoxy would. It will look a little duller. So all, for all those reasons, um, the polyureas are most widely used in stain polished concrete. Um, one important thing to think about that's related to that, though, is the polyureas do require special application methods. 
And you want to make sure when you're going into a job that you know how you're going to be installing that material. It's very tempting uh, for a polishing contractor to just when they when a client does say, I want my joints filled, to just throw a number at it, $2 a foot, whatever. Yeah, we can take care of that for a couple of bucks. Um, but depending on how you're installing that material, it can be a real, real substantial difference in your cost to install. Are you going to use a large dual component pump? Or are you going to be using dual cartridges, you know, and it's, and it's difficult to, to find that balance every time you go out to a job site, you look at the plans and they say, oh, there's only 1,200 feet of joint. I don't want to drag a pump out for that. But again, that's where you got to make sure that you're going to price everything properly. So let's just look at a quick, quick example here and a standard joint that we figure, even though it's saw cut at 1.8, it's going to open up to about 3 16 inch and a quarter deep, you're getting about 70 feet per gallon. If you're buying a bulky 10 gallon unit and you're paying 475 or 47.50 a gallon, your per cost foot for the material is going to be about 68.70 cents. Look at that same thing going through cartridge units. You know, basically looking at just over six cartridges to equal the equivalent one gallon of material. And if we're paying $35 a cartridge, all of a sudden now our our per gallon cost is 245 bucks. Big difference between that and $45. Now you're looking at 350 a foot just for your material alone. So again, if you just threw a number at that job, $2 a foot, now you've already started underwater before you even hit the job site. So when you're going into these things, bidding these projects, especially smaller ones, you gotta, you gotta bear that in mind. Just keep an eye on those kinds of costs. Um, it's not all the same and it's not simple to just make up that cost difference. So well, I just said exactly that. So that's probably why I built that slide because I knew I was going to say that. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about choosing the proper joint filler color. Again, this wasn't an option probably 10 years ago, a little bit more, maybe 15 now. You know, it's just like the Henry Ford model. You can have it in any color you want as long as it's black or gray. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of different colors to choose from, but someone still has to make that choice, right? So... One thing that we always recommend to all of our contractor partners that we work with is don't make the decision of what color to use on that floor yourself. Make sure that whoever makes that decision is either one, the one who's paying you, or the owner's representative. You don't want to make the call on your own and because it's a very subjective situation. Um, this slide's probably a little bit uh, old, but you could see literally any one of those four different colors showing on that on that joint line might be something that the owner likes the best. Um, you don't wanna make that call, but one, one tip that we do uh, have that we recommend is if you're in doubt between two different shades of a brown or something like that, typically the darker color is going to be the better choice. You don't want a lighter joint. It usually tends to stand out a good bit more. So if you are in doubt, you're right down to two, you know, two products that you really like, Fawn, Pebble, and Warm Stone, typically go with the darker one. As far as choosing the proper joint filler color too, this is very difficult. Obviously, if, you, if you're just looking at plans, you haven't been on a job site, but especially for remodel work, if you're going out and looking at something, you wanna make sure not to just take a cured sample and throw it down on the floor as it stands. You wanna try and do, if you don't have the opportunity to do a mock-up and get a base grind on that floor before so you can do some color matching, just abrade the surface someplace you know, with a rapid strip pad and wet it and you'll get a rough equivalent of what that polished product's going to look like, assuming we're not using a stain or a dye. Um, but uh, it's important not, not to, again, just not to throw a color sample on the floor as it stands when you walk into a building, because you could end up with something that does not match well at all. A um, Couple of other things to consider before you even hit the job site. Um, the potential for staining or surface etching. Like I said, with an epoxy, that's gonna be a real important potential a real risk for sure. With some polyureas, maybe not as much, but we're gonna wanna look at, are we gonna have to protect the joint edges somehow to ensure that we have a finished profile or a finished appearance that's uniform? That might entail using a stain prevention film like our SPF, might entail using painter's tape, something of that nature, but you might have to mask off the joint edges or the repair edges around, you know, bolt holes, things of that nature, if you're concerned about that. So here's an example of, you know, the, the filler overfill pulling off the surface treatment here. I mean, this was a stain probably, there might've been a guard product on it, but as you can see, if you go in to fill this after that whole process is done and you pull up all that surface fine, now you've got to go back and, and go back a couple of steps probably to try and make that look uniform again. Here's an example of filler overfill film or staining. 
this might just be a film from a polyurea that can later be razored off potentially. But as you can see, it's got a very, you know, uh, ugly appearance. It's not uniform with the rest of the floor. You don't want to go have to go back and reprocess every joint in that building. So you want to work ahead of time to see, do I need to do something to mask off those edges? Do I use a stain prevention film or tape? Do it on the front end rather than try and go back and mitigate it on the back end. It's going to be a lot cheaper. Um, one other important thing, we run into this all the time. That's why I have this, this particular slide. Um, when you get out to the job site, it's important to document any conditions on that, on that canvas to the substrate before you start your work. In this particular slide here, I know this is not an interactive thing like we usually do, so I can't ask what I normally would ask if anyone knows what this is. Um, but basically, these are, uh, these are scratch marks from the skid plate on the early entry saw. Whether, they got, whether it didn't have vacuum equipment, whether it got some gravel in front of it, whatever, those scratches and gouges are in the floor right now. And if you're just doing a cream polish, that might not come out. Well, I'll tell you, nine times out of 10, the general contractor is going to back, go back and suggest that you made those marks somehow during your razoring off process of the overfill. So if you see stuff like this, you want to you call it to someone's attention early on. Even putting stain prevention film in that, in that joint as it appears right now on the edges, that stain prevention film may not come back out of those scratches. You know, a filler might get into those scratches and actually discolor them. So you got to ask the guy, the guys ahead of time, what do you want me to do about these joints? And there's no guarantees that it's not going to look like this in the end. So, so again, just document it, get it in writing someplace before you end up getting hung with it. As far as the sequencing goes, we get these questions a lot about, you know, should I fill my joints before I start polishing? Should I do it afterwards? Should I do it in the middle? And typically speaking, we, our recommendation is to do the joint filling. You can certainly do it ahead of time, as long as you're not starting with too aggressive a metal, probably. If you're going to start at 16 or 30 or whatever, then you may want to wait a little bit longer, although that can provide some edge protection. Standard rule of thumb, though, is always do it at least before your last metal's cut or your transitional. You don't want to do it afterwards when you're into your resin steps, because the resin, if you do get an overfill stain, or some kind of a you know film, the resin's not necessarily going to take that out. Whereas generally speaking, your last metal's cut wood, even if you got just a tiny little bit of surface etch or whatever, that last cut should take it out. So generally speaking, you're going to want to do it before your last metal's cut in most cases, if if the project allows, or earlier in the process than that. Um, you want to do it generally before you put down stains or dyes. Um, because again, if you put down a stain or a dye, as we showed in that slide a few uh, a few steps ago here, you can pull up maybe some of the color back off the surface. You can pull up a, you know, guard type product or something if you applied it. So you probably want to put it down beforehand uh, in those cases. And as I referenced, the same thing with polish guards, any surface treatment, basically, you're probably going to want to put the joint filler down ahead of time or test an area to see what's going to happen if you don't. Um, Filler installation timing. I know this is some. This is something that's very important to the to the the finished product and its performance long term. It's also something generally that you don't have a whole lot of control over. But the standard ACI guidelines for installation timing after the placement of the initial concrete is to wait 28 days. We say 30 just for for round numbers minimum, and 60 to 90 days or longer is what ACI recommends almost never are you going to get 60 to 90 days uh, in, in this construction environment. So you're probably going to be looking at 25 to 30 days most of the time. The key here is if you're asked to install before that, there's some real concerns that you want to look at. Concrete shrinks, right? This is the reason that we have joints in concrete to start with, is to induce you know, breaking points in that concrete, planes of weakness, so that it breaks along straight lines instead of cracks randomly. Um, and concrete shrinks for a good period of time, depending on the thickness of the concrete, the mix design, everything else, you're looking at a good year, year and a half, possibly two years before all that shrinkage is gone. But a lot of it happens in the beginning uh, of, the, uh, of the placement process. I mean, the first 30, 60 days, you're probably getting half the moisture out of that. So the reason it's important is the more moisture that leaves the slab, the wider the joints get. As a rule of thumb, a typical saw cut, as I referenced earlier, um, is not going to stay at 1 8 When you get some shrinkage, it's going to open up to about 3 16 of an inch. Um, so your average joint opening is going to be 50 to 75% from the time of the initial saw cut to where it's gonna end up. 
you want to be as late in that process as you can. And so you get that when it's close to three sixteenths rather than be at one eighth and have it go to three sixteenths. Uh, these semi-rigid type fillers, even a lot of urethanes and elastomeric products cannot handle 50 or 75% lateral expansion. So with most of our fillers for semi-rigids, you're looking at five to 15% lateral expansion capability. So again, the, the longer you can wait, the better off. Um, the, other, the other thing I should mention too, when it comes to the 30 day period, it's partially for a, amount of concrete shrinkage to, to leave the slab you want it to be. It's only gonna be about 30% probably dried at that point. But that's also the stage where you probably don't have a ton of moisture coming through the joint walls. Because once you cut those joints into the slab, it's easier for the moisture to leave through the joint wall than it is a densely troweled surface. So 30 days is also from an adhesion standpoint. You wanna make sure that you're not trying to bond to a wet substrate. So again, these are just guidelines. These are ACI guidelines, manufacturer guidelines that we follow, but it doesn't mean that if you wait 90 days to install someplace, you're not gonna have any issues. A lot of it has to do with the environment that you're installing in. If you're in a building in July in Tampa, Florida, and the humidity is 100%, that slab is not shrinking at all. It's not gonna shrink until later on when they, when they turn the air conditioning on in that building, and all of a sudden, it's gonna shrink in two days. So it's important to remember that a lot of times you'll have a client say, well, you know, the spec said wait 60 days, wait 60 days, and we still have separation, what's going on with this? You can make, you know, there's obviously some other environmental aspects that could have, could have controlled that, uh, that shrinkage rate. Um, obviously, you could have high shrinkage mixed designs, wider joint spacing it has a real big impact on how much separation you're going to get at each joint potentially. The wider the spacing, the more shrinkage is going to be reflected in each of those joint locations. And so your joint could end up being, and, and some of you with some of these extended joint floor systems may have seen that out there. You got a joint at 50 or 100 feet, all that movement that normally takes place over four joints is taking place in one joint. That's why now it's at three eighths of an inch or five eighths or three quarters. So um, and we, we don't mind that so much actually. <laughs> so, so this, I probably should have put this slide earlier on here so, <clears throat> so I could mention separation before I referred to all the things that cause it. Um, but basically, this is what we're trying to avoid, right? As, as the concrete shrinks and the joint opens, um, the filler is designed to break loose, either internally, uh, which I is called cohesive separation, or, uh, or adhesively along the joint wall. Um, so basically, in the face of too much movement, this filler is going to extend a little bit, and then it's going to break loose at a bond point or internally. Uh, and again, it's designed to do this so it doesn't tear the concrete. If it stayed bonded, it would tear the joint edges right off. And that's what would happen if you put a structural in there. Uh, but still, aesthetically, obviously, this is not, is not an appealing look. It's probably something you're going to see in every retail store in this country because they're all filling it 20 or 25 days. Um, but this is something that the owner's going to be upset about. They're going to complain about. And you need to make sure you understand why it happens. And if someone asks you to install early against the specs, why you want to make sure you're covered in writing and say, say, Hey, you, you told me I have no responsibility. If I, if I install early, this is what happens when you install early. So again, check the specifications. Most major retailers, you know, the Walmarts, the Lowe's, the Home Depots, they all mandate minimum 30 days. A lot of them also add into that, that a climate full-time climate control should be activated in the building. Cause again, that really accelerates that process of drying shrinkage. If you've got, cool, dry temperatures in the building as opposed to high humidity and, and warm temperatures. So you get, if you get asked to install early, fine, you can do it. Just make sure someone signs off on it in writing, not verbal. Okay, get a couple other considerations prior to joint, joint filling startup. Ones I just mentioned, make sure, if, if at all possible, make sure that climate control systems are in place. It's especially important during the, the uh, summer months when it's uh, warm and humid. So. Here's another potential issue that I'm sure you guys have all run into with polyurea joint fillers. It doesn't affect epoxy joint fillers very much, um, but certainly with polyureas, there's the potential for a moisture reaction. Um, the isocyanate or hardener component of a polyurea is moisture reacted. It, it basically can cure with moisture as well as the polyol side. So anytime you have excessive moisture, either in the ambient air or in the joints themselves in the floor, you got the potential for this vapor drive, this bubbling, this moisture reaction with the isocyanate. Um, and one thing that you can do to help avoid this is communicate with the general contractor, 
or the whoever's running the facility that you're going into, tell them stop scrubbing the floor at least three days before you get out there. So at least we're not dumping more water into those open joints and having that moisture trap there. Yeah, the floor is gonna be wet polished. Then again, you're probably gonna to wanna to fill the joints before the polishing work starts. That way, again, if you're, if you're wet polishing a floor and dumping water into the joints before you start, you've already, uh, you've already hurt yourself before you get out there. Um, I should go back and just mention specific to that. Um, as some of you know, we do have a moisture tolerant joint filler, the Edge Pro 80. Um, so it might not have the same reaction uh, as we see in this picture, which is probably RS88 at the time. But uh, one thing I always like to point out, just because we have products and there's other products in the market that are moisture tolerant, doesn't mean it should encourage you to go ahead and install on a moist joint. You're still gonna have compromised adhesion no matter what. And more importantly, if you're in a moist floor condition, you know that means that the shrinkage process hasn't really taken place yet. So you're still gonna have to deal with that separation on the back end. So just because the chemistry will allow for insulation where there's a lot of moisture doesn't mean you should do it unless you absolutely have no chance but to avoid it. So um, the joint preparation is critical. I think this is getting better in the marketplace, but certainly this has always been a major issue for us. Um, run into a lot of jobs where someone's just trying to scrape the joints out with a five and one tool or, uh, you know, use compressed air, which you don't see often anymore, thankfully. But, but it's very important for these fillers to bond properly that you have mechanical uh, cleaning of these joints and that you get back to bare virgin concrete. You know, by the time you've got onto the job, there's been curing compounds in the slab, potentially, possibly a dense fire application. And all those things serve to close off the open pores of the concrete walls. And that's partially what we're relying on to adhere to. So it's important to go back and mechanically abrade these joints, remove any dust, debris, latents, whatever is in the joints before you get out to, to, uh, to fill the joints. The only acceptable means of doing that is obviously gonna be, like I said, mechanically with a saw or grinder. We used to say preferably dustless, now it's not an option anymore because of the OSHA silica regulations has to be dustless. Um, you know, again, raking a joint out, scraping it with a five and one tool on a broomstick, these types of things and vacuuming are not gonna be sufficient normally and more likely gonna lead to greater separation and, you know, uh, other possible, you know, deterioration of the joint if it's not done properly. Um, so when we walk into a job site, you know, to see you guys starting up, these are the kinds of pieces of equipment we wanna see. You know, small concrete clean out saws designed specifically for this dust collection uh, hooked up to them. We don't want to see, you know, the, uh, the joint clean out equipment from Murray. So uh, even though it's a lot less expensive to do this, uh, this is not going to comply with your OSHA regulations and uh, is not going to get the job done any longer. Um, make certain that your joint clean out saw reaches to the depth of the joints you're supposed to clean and fill. Obviously, all these different pieces of equipment that are out there have different capacities for cutting depth. So in our, our, for those of you out there that do work in industrial facilities, warehouse distribution center, you'll occasionally run into a job with two inch what, or two inch deep joints, two and a quarter inch deep joints. If we go out there and we see that you're using, you know, an old crackback saw that can only reach to an inch and a quarter, then obviously we know you can't be cleaning the joints all the way to two inches. So make sure you marry up your equipment that you're gonna use to the joint depth you have to clean to. Um, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on dust collection. Um, maybe Ronnie you might want to spend some time on that, but it's important. Again, just don't go out to Home Depot and buy whatever shop vacs on sale. You need good, proper HEPA filtered dust collection equipment. The standard rule uh, is quarter or is 25 CFM for each inch of blade. So normally that's going to translate out to using a 7 8 inch blade, 175, 200 CFM minimum. So, <coughs> excuse me one second. So what it really boils down to, do you get paid or do you pay fines or damages? And I know uh, it's been a while since the whole OSHA silica regulation thing has been kind of a hot topic in the industry. But I can tell you in going to these uh, board meetings and being on these monthly calls with the Concrete Polishing Council, there's contractors out there left and right getting nailed all the time. Uh, at least there was before this COVID-19 crisis. So. Uh, so they are serious about it. There's no doubt about it. You know, I thought when this was being implemented, like everything else the federal government says they're going to do, they weren't going to do it. But I, I'm hearing real world stories from a lot of people and a number of people that paid pretty substantial fines. So 
So it's, uh, they're, they're serious about it. And they should be, it's about worker safety. So, um, so again, inadequate joint preparation cleaning, it, it's a big problem. We're gonna be able to identify it quickly if we get called out. If we get called out by the owner or general contractor, it's, there's no defending what you see here. It's clear that the joints weren't prepped properly. They weren't prepped to the proper depth. They, the sidewalls weren't clean. It stands out like a sore thumb and there's no defense for that. You're ripping it out and replacing it at your own dollar. Um, again, it might look great on the surface. Very simple to, to expose uh, poorly filled joints. Um, this was at a Whole Foods store just uh, 20 minutes from me. <laughs> Installer actually asked me to go out and look at it because they were complaining. <laughs> I went out there and I'm like, yeah, I can see why they're complaining. <laughs> That's not going to do it. So you can't fill an inch and a quarter joint with, uh, with 3 16ths inch of uh, joint filler. So it comes right out when you scrub. Um, so again, review the project specific filler installation specifications. There are some projects out there. Uh, Kroger stores is a good example. You know, our standard specification can, may can say uh, install a quarter, you know, uh, full joint depth. So that's an inch and a half deep joint. Kroger specification is fill joints to one inch deep because they want a little bit more movement capability. So make sure you review the specs, not only our manufacturer's specs, but the specifications for whatever projects you're looking at so that you're not bidding an inch when someone else is bidding an inch and a half, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all other bets, you know, things being similar, typically the standard uh, detail for joint filling is going to be full depth or two inches, whichever occurs first. There's a lot of confusion about this for whatever reason. If you got an inch and a half deep joint, don't cut it two inches, please. Fill it to an inch and a half. The only time the two inch rule applies is when you've got a joint that's deeper than two inches, uh, like a construction joint or a cold joint. Um, and oftentimes even there, if the joint's cut to two and a quarter inches deep, it's probably gonna be more practical from a labor standpoint to just, <coughs> excuse me, I don't have coronavirus, I promise. I just got a dry throat. Um, it's gonna be a lot easier to uh, probably just fill it two and a quarter inches deep without trying to get a backer rod down to exactly two inches or you know meter that out, pay for the backer rod, the installation tools, everything else. A lot of times it's gonna be easier just to fill. But if you got a three inch deep joint, you wanna have that conversation, make sure the owner understands, I'm gonna fill this two inches because I'm not putting 50% more material in here and not getting paid for it, so. We also recommend using a two-pass method. Um, th there's a couple of reasons for this. And you see in that first base pass, basically we're gonna fill it up to within about a half an inch or so of the surface. This not only allows when you come back for your second bead to be a little bit neater with it and a little bit more precise, but it allows you to see, and I'm sure you've all seen these as, that are involved in joint filling, there's a shrinkage crack at that base of the joint. Sometimes you get a dominant joint or something like that with a large shrinkage crack. There's going to be certain areas of the floor where that material is just going to run through, run through, run through. If you've overfilled it to the surface, you've wasted a bunch of material when it's run through. If you fill just the base bead, you can see right away which areas are going to sink. Maybe you come back, put a little silica sand in there to, you know, to dam it off. Maybe you put another pass and wait a little bit longer. But you're going to, you're going to eliminate a lot of waste if you do a two-pass method. Um, you can use a one pass method with polyurea joint fillers. Again, some of these things apply to both products, but because polyureas gel so quickly, a lot of times Edge Pro 80 is a good example, 45 second gel time. You can probably do a one pass method because you know where you're gonna end up 45 seconds later. If you're using an epoxy joint filler, that material is taking three, four hours before it starts gelling. You can lose a lot of epoxy with a one pass method. So. With polyurea, one pass can probably be acceptable. It all depends on the individual user's uh, uh, preferences. So again, by and large, though, this is the other thing that we run into. Everyone wants all about production. Do as much as quickly as we can. Slow and steady is usually the best way to install as far as using the least amount of material. Not great for me, not great for Runyon, but good for you guys <laughs> because you don't want to leave three quarters of your joint floor sitting on the floor surface. It doesn't do any good makes the shaving process that much more difficult. Um, this is the kind of thing that we want to see when we walk onto a job site. I'm not sure how good your screens are at home, but you can see that there's some been stain prevention film put down that's going to make the razoring process easier. The narrower the bead you have on that surface, the easier it's going to be to shave off too. And we haven't wasted a ton of material on the surface. This is probably more common to what we see when we go out there. And again, this is great for us, great for Runyon. 
not so good for you guys. I mean, if you're bidding that on the 70 foot coverage rate and your guys are putting beads down like that, you're not getting 70 feet. Now all of a sudden you're off by a third on your job if you're throwing that much material on the floor. And that's from rushing, uh, not from, you know, doing a two pass method. It's just, it's better to be slow and methodical about these things than it is fast like this. Plus that's gonna leave a pretty hideous stain on the surface as well, so. Um, faster gel time, there is a risk of entrapped air. Again, I, we don't really have a slide for this in this presentation, but when you're installing a quicker gelling polyurea joint filler, you're gonna have to increase the angle of your, of your uh, installation a little bit. You're injecting the material more at that point than you are running you know, kind of parallel and having it fall down. The quicker the gel, the, the more you're gonna have to increase the angle of that, uh, of that dispensing tip. And this is an example of you know, a job where a fast gelling polyurea was put in and gelled so quickly the air that was coming up from the bottom didn't have time to get out. So you can clearly imagine that doesn't provide a very good solid joint at the end. The profile of the, of the filler is critical. So again, we're, we have to overfill all these joints in order to get a flush filler profile. But in the end, what's really important is that we have it flush with the surface. Here's a situation where it's a little bit low. And again, if this is a really heavily trafficked uh, building like a, uh, a warehouse distribution center, those wheels from that forklift are gonna find those edges very quickly and start damaging the joint. In an aesthetic standpoint though, with a polished concrete floor, stained polished concrete floor, low spots uh, collect dirt and debris from the scrubbers. So this is gonna stand out to the owner right away that something's wrong with this joint. Why is this thing always dirty? That's because the profile is gonna be low, right? Same thing if you're coming and staining this floor afterwards. Uh, after you've done your joint filling, all that extra stain is gonna puddle in there and probably discolor and later flake off. So again, it's just gonna call out all the problems in the installation. Um, a lot of national retail specs will call for, um, you know, a certain profile of this finished filler. It's very difficult to get any polyurea joint filler dead flush. This is one of the disadvantages of polyureas. With the epoxies, with the heating and shaving process, you almost always get a dead flush. With a polyurea joint filler, depending on the circumstances, the, the, the slab temperature, the humidity, everything else, the ideal shave time to get a flush profile varies. And so that's one of the real challenges of the polyureas in these settings. But a lot of retailers are gonna mandate, they're gonna to wanna to put them some kind of straight edge down or a flashlight and see or run their fingers over it. Is there any kind of concave profile at all? They can reject it on that basis. So it's very important that you dial in your shave time on each job. Just one, one tip, the lower the, the angle of the, uh, of the shaver, the better. So if you can find an entire crew of little people, that's so much, is, I hope that's PC now. All right, never mind. Um, <clears throat> is it, Kristen? Do you know? That's the term, right? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the lower the shave angle, the, the flush your shave is going to be. You don't want to be up there ratcheting like an ice scraper. You want to be as low as you can, preferably with a handle down near your kneecap someplace to get a really smooth profile. Um, so I'm going to bring up separation again real quickly, just because it is probably the biggest callback item that you get. Um, this is one of the reasons when it comes to the communication, I think before you go into a job, whether it's 30 days slab cure, 40 days, whatever, discuss the potential for separation, especially if you know the circumstances are there, wide joint spacings, or hey, it's uh, the middle of the summer and I know that these joints are still tight, they haven't opened at all. Figure out on the front end who is going to pay if it needs to be fixed. You don't want to assume the responsibility for it yourself as an installer. You might give somebody a unit cost to come back and do it ahead of time. That's the most fair way to do it probably. Um, but you got to figure out who's going to pay for it. So, um, As a general guideline, uh, ACI recommendations, if it's less than credit card width or about 0 0.030, 32nd of an inch, uh, usually don't have to do anything to correct it. Um, it's not going to lead to enough exposure that the joint edges are going to get deteriorated or spalled. The only exception to that is if you're in a sanitary facility like a food facility or a drug facility that's FDA regulated. Occasionally at that point, the owner might want to go back and refill those. But from a traffic standpoint, generally speaking, anything less than credit card width or less does not need to be corrected. Obviously, if you get greater than that or you got complete adhesive loss on either side of the joint um, and the, you know, the filler is just sitting in there like a loose rope, it's going to have to be mitigated. Uh, that's this joint filler and this joint obviously not providing 
any kind of benefit or protection at all. So, um, when should it be corrected? This is another thing. I mean, it, you know, this you're probably going to see it on a retail project right after the store opens. You know, 90 days. They got an HVAC on finally. Everything's going. All of a sudden, everything starts opening up and uh, separation occurs. They're going to want you in there right then to fix it. Obviously, because shrinkage takes place over a period of time, you want to delay as long as you can to fix that separation to get as much shrinkage out of that slab before you go back and fill it so you're not filling separation voids twice. Um, you want to make sure, again, that the climate control systems are activated. And if you're in a building that doesn't have that, you don't want to do it in the middle of summer. You want to do it, you know, either when the joints are the widest, like winter or spring, uh, because the cooler, drier temperatures lead to the joints being at their widest, typically. So just make sure. And, and then again, last point, obviously, earlier, if, if dictated by the owner. If the owner says, hey, I, get, I need these things filled, I've got an FDA inspection coming up, or more likely, I just had one, because um, that's when everybody does things. Um, then you got to do it when you got to do it. As far as how to correct it, there's two options. I mean, it's very rare that you're going to get such a clean separation along a joint wall that you can just go back and fill that, that separation void, but it does happen. Um, more common is the one on the right, option number two, to go back and mill, just mill, and mill the top half inch of that filler out and reinstall filler around the existing filler as long as it's well bonded. Um, the other benefit to this is, is the, uh, the surface, you're gonna have a far more uniform appearance. Uh, if, you, if you go with option number one, and this is, even if you chose the same color joint filler, after four, five, six months, it's, it's not going to, to be exactly the same as, as it was when it was installed. You know, it's gonna be exposed to light, whatever else. So you could get like a zebra stripe look to the filler. So going with option number two, where you're milling and capping and you got a solid slug of new material on top, can get you the best uniform appearance. Again, when we're talking about milling and capping, there's special blades out there. This is a Stellite blade that I know Runyon carries um, that, are, that are well designed for kind of chunking this material out rather than, uh, you know, burning it. So, uh, and this is basically what you'll end up with and it's just a, just a top half inch gap that you can come back through, got clean sidewalls to bond to and, uh, and just refill and top that. So look at that, we're at the end. What, I know you guys thought, that it could, could being quarantined really get any worse? And yes, it can. You could listen to probably, what, 35, 40 minutes of me talking about joints. So but, uh, I appreciate all your attention. And hopefully uh, the content was something that you were, were looking for. If, uh, if you have questions or uh, anything else that you want to discuss right now, I'm, uh, I'm, well, I'm quarantined in my office, but I'm quarantined like the rest of you. So I got all the time in the world. Thank you, Scott. That was a really good presentation. I, I don't know about the rest of the Runyon team, but I personally believe I learned a lot from, from this one. Uh, so looks like we do have a few questions. Um, Sierra asked if Edge Pro 80 is, is forklift traffic rated. So we would, we would typically say no. Um, and the reason that we would typically say no is that is kind of what I was addressing earlier. According to ACI right now, uh, ACI specifications for trafficked industrial floors call for a shore hardness of A80 or greater. That goes all the way back to MM80 in the 1970s. Back then we had hard pneumatic tires. We had, you know, we had soft rubber tires. We didn't have small, you know, two inch urethane and steel caster wheels. So if you look at most of the joint floors in the market, uh, the Yuko 700s, the, you know, the other products that you'll see in an industrial application, they all have shore A hardnesses in the 90 to 100 range. So for us, uh, 85 is about the minimum that we like to see. The only reason I won't say that 100% no, never do that, if the building does have hard pneumatic tires or something like that, let's say it's not running three shifts a day, whatever, yeah, probably be okay. Where I wouldn't want to see that would be a Amazon distribution center, right? Running 24-7, 365, you know, high racks. I mean, that's where you don't want to see it. So I guess I would say qualified could be used if, if it was a, a, a moderate duty warehouse. But by and large, I would defer to the either Edge Pro 90 or the RS88 for that kind of application. Because so, we're getting into that 88 to 90 range as far as the hardness goes. So. 
So to s- simple terms to clarify it for everybody, basically um, the hard the harder the shore hardness is, the more the more durable the material will be. The more rigid, and and so the the less likely to deflect. There's some people in the industry that believe that the shore a hardness should match or be higher than the sh- uh, the shore a hardness of the wheels that are being used, because these a lot of these wheels they use the same uh, hardness measurements that we do. Uh, these are designed, this Shore A was designed to, to measure hard rubbers. So even your urethane caster wheels that you see on these, these uh, pickers, um, they're going to have A hardnesses in the 90 to 95 range. So we'd like to have a similar hardness to protect. If you're running something that's 95 hardness over an 80 hardness, you got some potential for, you know, for impression in that, in that filler, for deflection. So... I would say that you want to try and get close to what the hardness of your wheels is going to be, I guess, for lack of a better term. So. Uh, I wanted to ask a question also in regards to the, the polishers that are out here. I see we got a, we got a variety of a lot of people that polish. Um, talking about your products lines, uh, SRG versus pit grout. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so pit grout came out before the SRG. Um, and technically, all these products are basically structural, rapid set structural urethane type products. The, the pit grout was essentially a slowed down version of the rapid refloor because people had been using that as a grouting product as well. The difference with the SRG um, is it, it, it does, it's the only product in our entire line that has some solvents in it. So that allowed for a couple of things. It allowed for a little bit better penetration into the substrate because it was we could get it a little bit thinner. Also because that's an extender rather than a you know a premium resin, it's a little bit less, it's a little more cost effective. Um, the the downside to the SRG um, is that in, in partially to make it a more cost effective product, we make it in a more limited range of colors. There's 11 colors available. You might you would want to use the pit grout perhaps if you wanted any of the, you know, 120 plus colors that we have in our line. Let's say you had somebody that's doing a red floor and they want a red grouting product. You're not going to find that in the, uh, in the SRG line. SRG is primarily, those colors are focused on where 80% of the market is, browns, grays, tan colors, things of that nature. The other advantage to the pit grout is that it's a quicker grind off time than the SRG has. So with a pit grout, you could be grinding probably as little as 20 minutes with the SRG, you're probably going to be more in the 45 minute to an hour range. So where that's been important is those types of facilities where you're doing retail remodel work at night, say, you know, that 20, 25 minutes difference makes a big difference. And they might, it might well be worth having to pick up. So, um, so that, that's, but, it, but again, each, there, there are a lot of similarities between those three products. So I understand, uh, you know, the nature of the question. The other key, as far as affordability goes, is the SRG is a hand mixable product, so you're not paying for all the cartridge packaging, like you do with a pit grout product. So, so in performance-wise, very similar in the end. So. Excellent. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I didn't muddle that up more than it already was, but, <laughs> but I did <laughs> my best. Great. There, there's definitely overlaps in our systems at different places, right? I mean, and I understand it's. It's sometimes it is very very confusing. Why would I go with Edge Pro 90 over MM80? Why would I go with uh, Edge Pro 90 over RS88? And there's different, there's certain different applications and situations, whether it's access time, you know, uh, shave time, polishability, things of that nature. There are reasons that all those fillers exist, but I understand how if you're going onto a job site and someone says, I need a joint filler, and you look at our line and there's seven to choose from, you're like, wait, well, why isn't there just one? And it's really is, and it's just true of all of our products. We design things for specific applications when there's need for it in the market, or when we think that there's, you know, that something's not serving its, its full function well. So that's how we end up with so many different products, because there are so many different unique applications in the market. And because joint fillers are really what we do and all we do, with, except for some of the repair products, I mean, we have that many different ones for the many different markets, so food, cold storage is a whole different market. So there's, there's different products for each of those applications. You can't have one size fits all. Right. Right. And I know a lot of that spec driven too, but you know, for, for guys that are, you know, 
walking into uh, places that still have not been, you know, influenced by a spec or what have you. It's, it's, it's good common knowledge. Um, another, another question I wanted to talk about too, for, for everybody out there is, you know, uh, climate, not, not just climate, but also um, time frame of products. So let's say, you know, uh, some of the seasonal guys, you know, they'll, they'll have a bucket left over, some material left over and, mm -hmm. You know, it gets cold, it freezes up. What, what, what is, what does Metzger think about, you know, time frame and climate with product? I'd say any time after you use a product, just throw away and buy more. So. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, basically, so if you're looking at epoxies, um, they, all our products have a published one year shelf life, but epoxies literally would last for 10 or 15 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the polyureas are a lot more sensitive based on the way they're stored and whether they've been exposed to moisture or not. So like I said, the isocyanate, very moisture sensitive product, even in the moisture insensitive product lines, the, the isocyanate itself is still moisture sensitive. So, you know, shelf life wise, I mean, you know, if you, let's say you bought 50 gallons for a job, you only used 40, you can certainly take that 10 gallon kit of polyurea and use it probably safely for the next two years. So, I mean, probably a full year beyond the, the shelf life that we published. As far as the freezing aspect that you asked about, Bosco, generally speaking, if, if once it freezes, it gets a, a milky white appearance, the isocyanate does. Generally speaking, heating that back up, you're gonna have to get it heated up to probably 90, 95, can typically remove all that appearance, and usually the material will be okay to use. Um, uh, most of these products are okay. But again, you, you, what you want to do if you have that kind of condition, you've been storing it in, you know, upstate Minnesota for, you know, the whole winter, you know, test it before you get to the job site. You know, just, just pull out some material, hand mix a little bit, see if it reacts the way that you expect it to. Call our, call our technical service support team if you're questioning, um, you know, et, et cetera. You know, I think the one thing that I would really caution people not to do too much, even though it can be done, is reusing cartridges and storing half-used cartridges for a long period of time. Typically not gonna be worth it. I mean, if, if you're halfway through a 600 milliliter cartridge, there's no sense in throwing that in the storeroom and pulling it out six months from now when you need to go back and do touch up on a job. It's just very difficult to properly store a half-used cartridge and ensure it's not been moisture you know, penetrated or anything else like that, so. Um, it, it can be done, but I just, I think most of it, you still have to go through the same procedures of purging the first three shots and everything else. So by the time you do that, is it really worth risking using a year and a half old cartridge that's been sitting in the warehouse? So, right. Bulk, uh, bulk units are a different deal though. So. Great. Um, I think it was a great webinar. I, uh, I know, um, we personally at Runyon really want to thank you, Scott, for your time and for, uh, for putting this together. I thought this was, again, very informative and very great for, for the uh, attendees. I know we've averaged between anywhere between 35 to 40 some people on this webinar. So that's an excellent turnout. Yeah. I mean, honestly, in, in, in uh, versus some live trainings that are in person, uh, we've got a pretty big attendance here. So that's great. Are uh, we sure that everyone understood what kind of joints I was talking about, though? <laughs> so, <laughs> you never know. Maybe that's why we lost. Yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> well, if they if they didn't, now they do. <laughs> so yeah, yeah now they're probably um, disappointed. But that's okay. Kristen, I know you, uh, we we were gonna do a, a joint giveaway um, as far as yeah, Onion we, and uh, Metzger. Yeah, we did an automated um, an automated. Um, selection and it picked randy schleisman at the very beginning uh he was one of the people that signed up out of the 55 right. people so um we just randomly picked through that automation so he will get a uh, one 10 gallon um unit of any of metzger material so whatever he decides to pick we can send that out to him there you go randy just let us know uh you know which color pack you'd like we'll get that taken care of for you and we'll get that right over to you Awesome. Well, thanks again, Scott. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me and uh, glad we got the chance to, to visit a bit. And um, I'll be happy to, 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 we can do future seminars on other topics if you want. So we got plenty, plenty of material. So. Awesome. All righty. <laughs>
Thank you to all of our attendees as well. Um, we'll be back here uh, later on this week. I believe the one tomorrow is canceled with um, Gorilla Saws, but we will be back here on Thursday with Bill Glenn with U.S. Saws. Um, so join us back here, uh, same time, same place on Thursday. So thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.